Welcome back, everyone. We've got more people in the self-marginalized zone in the back there. You, can you see on the screen? There we go. So panel number two today is a fascinating group of women. This is called Building a Company and Failing Fast. Um, and we'll talk a lot about failure, but um, we're also going to talk about success and interesting lives of entrepreneurs. So let me introduce our panelists here. Um, in the white coat on this end is Riva Tez, and she is a founder of Permutation Ventures. Um, we have Lauren Washington on the other side. I should swivel. And uh, she's the co-founder of Funder, which we'll find out more about in a second. Um, back over here, we have Mickey Heller, who is the VP of Operations and Strategy at a company called Astronus. And back over here, we have Ryan Buckley, who's the founder of Fitcode, which is also super cool. And so we've got a group of women who have either started or worked at a startup and are going to share some stories about the perilous uh, journey of being an entrepreneur in high tech. Um, so starting your own company, ladies, is both exciting and scary, or working at a company. Um, each of you have experience in that arena. Tell us uh, what mindset you need to have, or skill set, mindset, skill set, maybe both, um, that you think people need if they want to go this direction in a high tech career. Lauren, you want to, or, yeah, give us a start. Um, I think in terms of mindset, there are a couple different things. Um, I think you have to be very flexible, um, open to whatever is thrown at you and being able to take it and solve whatever comes up. Um, I think you have to have a lot of perseverance, <laughs> uh, but also know when to stop persevering. I think this whole panel is about failure and understanding when the signs say stop. Uh, but, but definitely being able to work through a lot of the ups and downs and the roller coasters of being an entrepreneur. And then in terms of skill set, you really just have to be able to do everything, quite honestly, especially in the beginning. You're wearing every single hat from marketing to product development to answering customer service emails. So it's really about more being a jack of all trades than you know, a master of one thing, I would say. Before we go on, I think it would be cool if each of you kind of gave a little snapshot of the company that you've started as well. Would that be good? Yeah. So tell us about Funder. So Funder is um, actually my third company. Um, the, the first company I started was Keep Up, um, and we are actually uh, uh, shutting that down and selling assets. So that's sort of my um, you know, fail fast story. <laughs> uh, and then I also run Black Women Talk Tech, which is a membership organization for black women founders. We have a conference coming up um, at the end of this month. We'll have over 1,000 people there. And then Funder, um, I just started this fall, and we are automating seed investing for startups and angel investors. So a person you want to know. Ryan, tell us both about, your, about FitCode, and then talk to us about what you think mindset, skill set. Wonderful. Yeah, so FitCode was a personalization software. So we personalized e-commerce sites, so we did... Um, denim, men's, women's denim, so think Joe's jeans, AG jeans, Hudson jeans. We integrated our technology straight onto their site, and when you hit their site, you would take our quiz, it was five questions, and we would personalize the whole experience so you're only seeing jeans that were going to fit. Super great product. We actually wound down in September of this last year just because of investment reasons, which we can get into later, um, but personalization fit is all about what we did. To start a startup, I think you have to be equal parts fearless and also a little naive. Um, I think especially with your first startup, being naive kind of helps because you have no idea what you're getting yourself into and it is a roller coaster. Um, but perseverance is huge and I think more than anything you have to be passionate because you are going to wear every single hat and no one is going to care as much about the company as you are. And so be super, super passionate about what you're doing and just be willing to work when no one else is. Wow. Mickey. Hi everyone. Huh? Hi people in the back. Um, so I work at a company called Astronis. Uh, we're an aerospace startup. We build low-cost telecommunication satellites. Uh, a traditional telecommunication satellite can be, you know, the size of a double-decker bus, costs $300 million to a $1 billion. Um, we'll be building satellites that are closer to the size of a washer-dryer and closer to $20 million, and that allows us to 
um, serve markets that are otherwise un unservable from an economics perspective. So, um, so we'll be bringing internet to the parts of the world that are otherwise underserved. Um, okay, mindsets, so many. Um, I'll share a few thoughts. Uh, one, and I think this is, uh, this is a mindset you need for a startup, but I kind of think this is uh, good career advice in general, is to just try to find interesting things to do. I know that seems really obvious, but um, I think a lot of people end up taking a job that uh, is, n is not that interesting. And so I think like figure out what is really interesting to you. Um, and that, uh, that's like a really good test of whether that's something that you want to spend your time doing. Um, for me, I think personally, uh, I, there are a few things that I want in a job. Um, I want a job that's intellectually challenging. I want a job that's personally fulfilling. Um, and I want a job that, you know, has good work-life balance, has the ability to make me money, like some of the more personal things that are also important. Um, I was able to find that in Astronus, and I think uh, that's, to me, that's one really important thing to look for when you're thinking about starting a company. Um, second is, this is a, a mantra from Y Combinator, which is, uh, we're a Y Combinator company. They say, make something people want. Uh, I think a lot of times in Silicon Valley, people forget about that. They forget to think about the end user. Um, mm. And uh, I, I, to me, the difference between a company that succeeds and a company that fails is that a company that succeeds is because they made something that people want. Um, and then the last uh, mindset that I have is in line with Lauren's. I one time read a great blog post. Uh, it's called, you're not the CEO, you're the fucking janitor. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that speaks really true of what it means to work at a startup. You just can't have any ego. You can't have like this glamorous idea of what it means to be a founder. Um, you are a jack of all trades. You are taking out the trash. And, um, and if that is exciting to you, then the startup world is a good fit. It's kind of the opposite of what Mark Zuckerberg put on his first business card. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Riva, talk to us. <clears throat> that was a good segue because my LinkedIn says I'm a janitor at a hedge fund. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I used to have a, well, I spent the last three and a half years running a machine learning venture fund, which I co-founded. Um, and I, when I first got the email to speak at this, I was like, well, I can't, I haven't spoken anything for a year and a half because, uh, you know, that thing didn't go the way I wanted. They were like, but you can speak about failure. And I was like, fantastic. Uh, I know a lot <laughs> about that. Um, and before that, I had a startup in Berlin, um, which didn't fail, but sucked. Um, but I know that now with hindsight. And before that, I had a toy store, so definitely didn't have a traditional career path, which I actually did great. So maybe I should just go be Willy Wonka and forget about the tech stuff. <laughs> um, mindset. Uh, well, it's hard for me to think about this stuff because like, I just know I'm insane. But uh, I guess just not really caring. Like, uh, I, like the f I really wanted to be on this panel about failure because um, I think I have an interesting... Uh, sort of non-response to failure where it just doesn't really affect me anymore. And, uh, and uh, I think if you have that and you don't care too much about status or any of those like other metrics a lot of people use as benchmarks, then you can actually get really far. Um, so I don't know, I think failing is great and I am looking forward to talking about that a lot. That's awesome. I, I, I'm already like so excited for this panel because I think this is gonna be like a bit of a free for all. So we're good, right? Um, let's go back to, well, not all the way to your childhoods, but when did you first know that you wanted to be a maker, like a starter, a founder, of a, or, or that that was the area that you wanted to go into? This is more a general question. We'll get into the technical side of things in a bit, but just sort of personal story. When did you figure it out? Anyone can go, the microphones are not attached. I mean, I'll say that as a child, I was super stubborn and I didn't take direction well. And so I think that's probably a pretty <laughs> clear sign that I wasn't gonna be easy to manage and go corporate right away because I had my own ideas about how things should be done. Um, you know, anything from mowing lawns to washing cars, I was always in it to see how I could get money out of my parents for jobs while my sister, you know, is a, in the army and she was all about doing it for free and for goodwill. And I was like, no, we need, you know, to capitalize on this. We can do it. We can make money. So I think that was all probably a sign that I was going to create something and try to make money somehow. That's actually quite funny. <laughs> to your mother, you're not the boss of me. 
Um, okay, I have a similar-ish one. I think I think some of these qualities that people um, view as negative, like stubbornness, are actually like early indicators. So for me, like I'm just a complainer. If something isn't exactly right, if something's like you know, if I get a new piece of technology and it doesn't turn on quite quickly enough, or if I'm sitting at a table and it's wobbly, these are things that really bother me, and I complain about it. Um, I think like then you know that can be seen as a negative. I think there's like one extra step, which is like I also. Uh, don't just let that fester. Like, I want to fix it so that I don't have anything left to complain about. And that, I think, has always been true for me ever since I was little. Yeah, I think my story is pretty similar. Uh, when I was 11, I had probably three different businesses. I was babysitting all the kids in the neighborhood, which now they would not let you do at 11, but no. apparently back then it was fine. Not without a certificate. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I remember I sourced tomatoes from my neighbor's garden and then sold them on the street so I didn't have a lemonade stand. I had a tomato stand every summer. Um, I worked at um, a candy shop store that my neighbor had. So, I mean, all of this is like child labor law is like really illegal now, but I really wanted Loves to... <laughs> I really wanted to, to build something and make money, and I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't understand the full path, so I did end up going into corporate after college, um, but for me, that was always the end goal. You sourced tomatoes <laughs> as an 11-year-old. Yeah, in my case, uh, my family was just really poor, and I was like, shit, I need to make a ton of money. Um, so the first job I did was selling garden sinks at a trade show. They thought I was 18, but I was 16. I trained to the school. And I learned a lot about sales, and I sold these outdoor sinks. And then I started a toy store because I saw there was a gap in the market in the area that I was living. And I was like, wait, that might make a ton of money, and then I'll be able to do nice things for my parents. Um, and like, that's just it. I think that a lot of people think that there's like a bigger step between the two. There's like, you need to do all this stuff. I was just like, ah, oh, there's like something I should do to like make money. Then how do I make it the most? Um, so not too dissimilar from Ryan, I suppose. Are, are you detecting a thread here? Capitalism. A, a theme? Right. This is awesome. Um, okay, so talk about the technical. I mean, we're here at a sort of high-tech conference. We're talking to people who are in graduate school, generally speaking, on technology. Then how did you make the jump from sort of tomatoes and, you know, toys and jeans to technology? And satellites, I mean, that is technology. I, and I'll, to your question, I don't think I ever said to myself, gee, I wish I could buy an affordable satellite, but maybe in the future I can. <laughs> well, you probably even said you wish you could buy an affordable satellite, but you wish you have affordable internet. Well, you have it. That's true. That's one of the That's things we take for granted. Down, though. It's like, what's this providing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, go, talk about your technology edge of this. Um, for me, so I studied aerospace engineering in college, in part because I just wanted, you know, to my earlier point, to do interesting things. When I was in high school, I was pretty bored, and when, I, when it came time to choose my major, I said, what's, what sounds like the hardest one in aerospace engineering was the one I chose. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of my academic background. Um, I then spent about 10 years working in uh, business and strategy, and so now in my role I work at, I run operations and strategy at this aerospace company. It's kind of the perfect blend. Um, again, for me, like as a person who is a problem solver, technology is a way to solve a lot of problems very scalably, and as a person who wants to have as much impact as possible, technology is a really, uh, is a really good way to just have huge impact. So for me it was a very obvious choice. Um, that that's where I wanted to go. Hmm. Who next? Go, Reva. Uh, when I was running my toy store, um, which was literally did look like Willy Wonka's palace, um, I would want to change things. I'd be like, oh, I made this wrong and this wrong, and I want to change the design. Now, if you have a retail store, you have to close down the shop, bring in architects, um, designers, painters, all this stuff to, to try and change the design. And I was like, imagine if this was online. Uh, if this was just code, I could just change the code and the design would be different. And I was like, ah. There's something in that. Um, so I moved to Berlin. I sold my shares in my toy store, and I moved to Berlin to study, um, ironically, at the beginning, Ruby on Rails, which was probably not the best uh, programming language to learn at the time. But I did go to learn Ruby on Rails um, because I thought, imagine having a tool where you could just build things all the time, anytime you have an idea, and you don't have to take over a store, and you could have an online uh, idea or an app. Um, so after I did my toy store, I had a children's app because uh, obviously I learned a lot about kids, so we had a, an iPad app. But it, yeah, it's just a flexibility of technology to be able to just have a random idea and go with it from your pajamas in your living room is an unbelievable tool. It is. 
So I, I definitely did not know I wanted to do tech. Uh, like I said, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I had no idea what shape that would take. And I started Keep Up in 2014, which was an app. But if you think back, five years before, apps didn't exist. So there was no way that I would have known I would have taken this path. I think it was just being open to the possibilities and understanding the best way to execute whatever idea you have. And for me, that was through an app. And then once I got into that world, now I absolutely love it. And I think it's, again, what Mickey said, it's the, the opportunity and the scalability of it to have your ideas really grow and, and grow global without necessarily having to put in the same kind of resources that you would need for something that is more brick and mortar or product based. Ryan, what do you say? Yeah, for FitCode, uh, technology was the vehicle that we were able to get our solution out there. And so since we are dealing in digital commerce, we had to have some sort of really easy, really seamless solution that we could just drop a line of code onto these e-commerce sites. I am not technical, so I'm a non-technical founder of a technology company, and I think that's something that's really important to highlight because you can create a technology company and not know how to code, and the reason why is because we can hire really, really smart people like you all to come in and do it. And as a CEO, I think it's one of the you know best things to know is what you don't know, and hire people who are better than you in those arenas to come and build solutions. So, you know, if you're not a marketing person or a brand person, you can hire someone who knows that. So know your skill set, hire for what you don't have, and just keep charging ahead. Awesome. Well, let's talk about failure, shall we? Um, nobody sets out to fail, do they? I mean, you don't start a company and say, let's go and fail. You want to make money. But there's some conventional, uh, I would say actually counterintuitive wisdom that failing early, failing fast, is actually a good thing, and being too successful at the beginning can be a bad thing, which again seems counterintuitive. So tell us, even anecdotally, but also philosophically, what's good about failing early, failing fast, and what can be bad about being too successful uh, at the beginning, or even altogether, I don't know. Yeah, I'll contradict that a little bit. I think that, at least from our position, we did know we were going to fail and fail a lot in the beginning. And I don't think you're pushing hard enough unless you're having a lot of small failures along the way. And so anytime you're creating something that hasn't been created before, you're going to run into roadblocks and you're going to run into dead ends. We were like, wow, I really thought we were going to go this way with the solution and this wasn't the direction that our partners wanted. And that could have been a failure, but you just have to learn the art of the pivot. And when you get there, you realize, okay, that's a dead end. Let's pivot. Let's go this way. And you just keep failing. You just keep pivoting. And in the end, you're going to have success. So even with our company, it's like the product itself is absolutely phenomenal. I ran into a dead end with our investment and how we structured the cap table those things are fixable. And so if you want to just keep going, you just keep pivoting until you find your sweet spot. Um, I love that. And uh, um, a, a, a machine learning uh, analogy that I use for fa failure is that if you're a machine learning engineer and you try to build a, a model or a solve a problem, you have, like a, you have a model and you have data and data is the world and the model is like your method of problem solving. Now when you hit an error, you don't give up on the model, you just fine tune the model, right? So when I think about my career, I think about how I'm just continuously fine tuning a model to uh, like understand the world better. And uh, when I use that as a kind of like heuristic for life, um, then any failure is just like another data point for me to update my world model on either my skill set and the things I do or, or don't know, and also how the world actually works. Because like we're just born, we don't know how the world works. So every bit of failure is like another sign on how the world works, you know? So, uh, so yeah, like I love, I love failing, I'm, I'm really good at it. I love that. It's like a kid touching a hot stove. You do it once, you know, not to go back there. And so every failure, you just keep learning to fine tune yourself. I love how we're now like comparing ourselves to machine learning models and hyper tuning the parameters and going back in. This is San Francisco. <laughs> we could also make dating jokes around ML, but I won't go there. Uh, you know, and, and when I came in, on, look, in the car last night, I noticed all the billboards were for technology. It's not that way in other cities. Just isn't. Mickey, talk about, we haven't really talked about also the downside of success. And I think there is something to that, um, even though success is fantastic. But keep going, let's just keep this organic. Grab a mic when you want to talk. Well, I, I'll tell you what I think uh, maybe a non intuitive downside of success is, which is that I think if you are succeeding a lot, it just means you're not trying very hard. Uh, like you chewed off uh, like a 
a task that was too simple. And one easy heuristic, am I doing something sufficiently hard and ambitious, is that if you are, then you're failing a lot. Um, I think one of the non-intuitive things when you, that you discover when you are working at a startup is um, that if, uh, you know, when you're, when you're telling people your idea, uh, a lot of people tell you that it can't be done or that it's not a good idea. That's like when you know you're onto something. Because if it was obvious and everyone told you it was a great idea, then that business would already exist and it would be really easy and, and, and obvious. Um, and so I think getting used to the idea of being told no, being told it can't be done, sometimes finding out that actually it can't be done and you have to pivot. Um, I just think that that's the very nature of doing something hard. Um, if, you're, if you're experiencing too much success, it can feel good. You're sleeping easy at night, but you're doing something that's probably not, huh. not very ambitious. I fully agree with everything that everyone said. And to talk a little bit about um, succeeding too early, especially in the startup world, uh, with Keep Up, two months after we created our MVP, we ended up winning the 43 North competition. And we were one of 11 winners out of 7,000 people who had applied. We won $250,000. We got incubator space. But we were completely not ready for that. <laughs> and it was really <laughs> exciting for us. But at the same time, we hadn't tested it at all. Um, and so we're putting all these resources behind something that wasn't tested and that we didn't know was ready to scale. And so we pushed something that I think was, was not um, at the stage where we should have taken that funding. And that was something I didn't know at all <laughs> when I first started. Um, but I think that's a good example of having success a little bit too early. You have to really understand that product market fit before you really put the resources behind it to actually push and scale it. So on this thread, and I'm interested because, you know, when you have a resume and you're looking either for your next round of capital or you're looking for, you know, people to come join you or whatever it is you're looking for, um, does that failure impact your ability to take the next step or is this just back to your all um, mentality is I'm going to do it anyway whether anyone tells me I can or not? I mean, all the best people have, I mean, not all, some people <laughs> have not, but uh, most of the, of the best people have just failed several times until they've hit the thing that has worked for them. And I think if you can understand why you failed and convey that in a way that's extremely reasonable, then people will respond very highly to you. Uh, mm. and, uh, and I think being proud of your failures and expressing what the lessons learned are is an unbelievably highly regarded skill from investors and other entrepreneurs and mm. just the markets generally. Um, I'm actually writing a medium post now called uh, How Not to Start Your First Venture Fund, which I hope will be informative for everybody else who wants to start their first venture fund. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, I, I, when I write this stuff, it's like, you'd be surprised how many venture funds want to hire me. <laughs> and it's counterintuitive, but it's like, oh, you're, you've got a knowledge base of a problem domain that is, is valuable. And uh, it's like that thing with the ML model again. If you, if you can understand the data and if you, if you can fine tune it, then, uh, then every failure is, uh, is something that someone else will learn from. And actually, you can... Someone who's failed on something and probably mentor the people who have yet to fail a lot better. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll add one thing back to the success too early point. So I think it's really important when you start a startup to make sure you segment the different pieces of the business. So you have the product, you have your team, you have your investment, and then you obviously have your customer slash partner. And one thing that I experienced is we actually had success really early on with fundraising. So I was able to fundraise $3.7 million from one investor within a couple months. And that was fantastic, I thought at the time, and I had a lot of success there, but it ended up being the company's downfall because when you have one investor on, you only have one investor to do relations with, which is awesome because it's just one person to communicate with, but if they lose interest or if they decide that they want to take the company in a different direction, the cap table is a little wonky and you don't have a lot of control of the company anymore. And so you need to keep all segments of your business in line. So don't let fundraising go too much if your product or your team or even your understanding of what you're doing isn't in line with it. And so just make sure success is all kind of going at the same level across all segments of your business. Keep them in tune. So some of your answers have included what I would call the answers to this question, but um, what's one thing that you didn't know that would have been really helpful to know that you learned when you started your first thing? That would be, I mean, kind of school for people who didn't just 
head out and do it. Um, I think one of the things that people don't look at this much is kind of introspecting on what you're good and, and not good at and actually what you enjoy. So when I started my venture fund, I was like, I love meetings. And I love hanging out with people. It's great. And I would just sit in the office with like headphones on all day and they'd be like, Reba, you have to meet people. And I'd be like, oh, what? I hate it. <laughs> um, and it took me until 30 to realize that I don't like having meetings, which means investment is a terrible job for me. Um, but... You know, you have to do that with hindsight. And uh, so it's kind of this like introspection on what you enjoy. Because if you enjoy something, it doesn't feel like work. Um, the works I've been doing in the, in the last year and a half since realizing that, which is like isolated trading behind a computer, has made me very, very happy. But it took me a long time to realize that. So kind of figuring out what you like. Because I think society tells you what you like. It's like, oh, you like those things. And like, this thing is fun. But like, do you, at the end of the day, does it actually give you energy? Because if, if it gives you energy, then you'll just do it forever and it'll be fun. Mm -hmm. So finding out what makes you happy um, is a is like the first principle here, I think. Right. I would say it took me a while to learn not to ride the roller coaster of, of entrepreneurship. Um, I think we talk a lot on this panel, obviously, about failure. Um, but from day to day, you could get the best news of your life in the morning and then the worst news in the afternoon. Um, and you have to be able to, to sort of understand that that is not going to make or break you in either that role in your career in that startup or in life. Um, so I, I think we, we, we're talking a lot about failure. I don't want to be flippant about it. It, it mm. sucks. <laughs> it it's really can be very devastating, especially when you're, you're closing a company or you, you lost money or whatever it is. But you have to understand that as long as you're taking that and flipping it into a learning opportunity, um, you're only going to get stronger and you're only going to get better. So I, I wish I kind of knew that from the beginning so I could have been a little less you know, crazy in the beginning in terms of you know, my wins and losses. That's actually really a cool point because that emotional side of you know anytime you fail at anything you can you could let it get to you and if you don't have the right sort of I can withstand this storm it'll be devastating I'm in all, following on that note I remember when I first the reason why I started venture fund was that I went to interview a venture fund here and they were like we won't hire you and I was like well fuck you I'm just start my own but uh, <laughs> which was insane at 23 um, but uh, when I was raising my first venture fund, I mean, everybody said no. They were just like, who are you? You have no venture experience. Um, uh, why are you doing this? I'm like, I'm just doing it because I'm bitter because one venture fund wouldn't hire me. I didn't say that, obviously. Um, <laughs> and when I started raising, obviously, everyone started saying no. And then I spoke to a huge billion-dollar fund here. And I said, when you fundraise, like, it must have been so easy. And uh, this one guy who's had a huge billion-dollar exit was like, no, I asked, like, a 1,000 people. And maybe, like, 25 said yes. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> And then I realized that uh, I just, like, everyone has these kind of issues. And then I was like, well, you know what? I'm not asking enough people. And it took me two years to raise a, a, a small fund. And uh, it was, I kept uh, changing it. But it was hearing that thing from the other guy where he said that he'd asked a thousand people. Um, it really changes your, your perspective of stuff. And, uh, and, and you're just not thinking big enough, uh, almost, to try and solve it. So. The overnight success that took 20 years. Right, yeah, it's like, uh, it's, like, it's like we always think it's easier. I think it's especially the thing that women do as well. It's like they always imagine that it's easier, and then you, like, go talk to people, and then uh, no, it's, like, easier for them. And then you go talk to them, and they're like, no, I suffered through all of that. And I'm like, oh, okay. I had hoped it would be easier, but uh, apparently not. Yeah, I think one of the things is, uh, to this point, when you see other people's successes, it can feel as if it was very obvious and always planned, and they had a very clear, you know, path that they just easily walked down. Uh, I think that's actually very rarely the case. I think for the most part, one of the things that it means to be an entrepreneur, to, to do something new that no one's done before, is that you have to hear no a lot and that you, you don't exactly know where you're going. You know, it's a fog in the s and, and you, have to, you have to make your way through that fog. Um, and so I think getting used to the idea that you get a lot of no's um, mm. and that you don't exactly know where you're going and just feeling really comfortable with that. Again, to me, that's the... It, it's not for everyone, but if that is exciting to you, then, uh, then you can get a ton of value out of, um, out of having those experiences. I think you also need to understand that there's not a direct uh, career path to becoming a founder of a company. And so a lot of times people hesitate because they think, well, I didn't get my MBA, or I didn't get it from a good enough school, or I don't have technology background, or I don't have a marketing background. And you look at people who've been successful, and you think they had that, and that's why they're successful. It's not true. Everyone has imposter syndrome to some degree, and you just have to get out there and try it. And one thing that I've found in this whole process in meeting other founders and other CEOs is they all didn't believe they could do it too. And so when you know these people go behind closed doors, they wonder, wh who's gonna call my bluff? Like at what point is someone gonna say, how are you here? How are you running this company? 
every single person experiences that. So just know that you have the skills it's going to take. doesn't matter what your background is. Just have that passion and that drive to keep going. And, you know, we all have been there. We've all experienced that. I was totally going to talk about the imposter syndrome when I introduced everything today. And then I cut it out of my opening remarks because I thought, well, maybe no one else has the imposter syndrome like I do. But apparently quite a few people on the planet do. It's like today's the day that everyone's going to discover that I'm a fraud, that I can't really do this. So that's good. It's good to embrace. Um, we've been talking about pivoting and being nimble or agile when you're, when you're in this kind of a, an arena. But I wonder if there's, uh, if there's an opportunity to move too fast uh, versus too slow. I mean, there's a balance, obviously, when you're working in this environment. Um, is there a sweet spot? And, and how do you gauge whether you're going too fast or too slow? If letting, cause, because being an entrepreneur, you want to be like the person who does get the thing that nobody else did before. Be first, you know, no one remembers who was second. Um, talk about that fast, slow conundrum, if you could. I can take it back to the funding again, because that is where we failed and where we moved too quickly. And so I should have slowed that down. I was fundraising hot and heavy in the beginning, and I got out there and I realized I could get you know X amount of money that I thought the company needed to get to profitable. And when I was able to get it from one person, I thought, that's it. That's a closed door. This is awesome. We did it. All you know, sign on the dotted line. I should have slowed down. I should have pumped the brakes. You have to realize who you're getting investment from. You have to understand that that is like a marriage, and you need to know who you're going to make rich. And slow down when it comes to investment. You know, products can move fast, especially when you're creating with partners, big brands. You have to move quickly. But on the investment side, that's what everything comes back to. So slow down. Vet your investors. Don't just take money when it comes, because we all. You know, we know the 2% VC funding women rate right now. And so when you see money coming your way, you're like, I'm going to take that. Pump the brakes. Mm. Talk to a lot of people. Figure out where the money's coming from. Figure out what kind of money it is. And then go from there. That's great. And I think that actually draws onto a deeper thing, which is just like the people stuff, right? Like who you hire, who your investors are. Um, that is something that we rush because like you have this gut intuition that this person is great. Um, or in my case, like I just think everyone is fantastic all the time. Uh, and if you slow down and like really think about it for a while, uh, you might get to a different perspective. And um, especially in hiring, like uh, I remember when I started my venture fund, I was like, I'm gonna hire everyone that I like ever. Um, so I ended up with a huge team for a tiny fund, which was so stupid. Um, but uh, this was, was fun. And uh, and yeah, the the people stuff um, is is just something that people should really slow down on. You know that movie Up, where Doug the dog, he just comes up to anyone and says, oh, I've only just met you, but already I love you? <laughs> Apparently don't do that. <laughs> Nikki, I'll, what do you, oh, go ahead, Lauren. I'll, I'll say because I know this is all about exploring different careers in terms of looking at startups versus corporate or versus even research, startups are very, very fast. <laughs> so if you do not like to move quickly without having all the information that you need to make a decision that this is not the world for you. You don't have time to sit and make a strategy and do research for three months and then have a $50,000 budget to execute it. You really have to be very resourceful um, and willing to sort of take that leap and jump and see what happens. And again, it just goes back to failing, right? You're going to fail because you've never done it before. But it's, it's a very quick moving, fast paced um, industry. But your point is you have to make decisions when you don't have all the data, which is the problem with machine learning, right? It's, you know. So, Mickey, what were you going to say? Well, I agree with all you guys. Um, I think, <laughs> yes, I think, uh, you know, Facebook has this mantra, move fast and break things. And I think that that's a really good mantra when it comes to your product at a startup. Um, that's the break things is the part where you fail and you learn lessons and that's how you get to improve the product. Um, I also agree that when it comes to the people stuff, you don't want to move too quickly because if you end up hiring people, uh, that could destroy your team culture. For us at Astronis, we have a, um, a very rigorous hiring process that takes a long time. There's lots of technical screens. There's a lot of like um, projects that we make people do. And sometimes we get complaints from people. They say, well, I've already gone to offers at, you know, at other companies and you guys didn't move fast enough. Hmm. Um, and from our perspective, we say, okay, well, uh, you know, may maybe we lose a few good candidates that way and that's too bad, but at the end of the day, we want to be sure that the people who we work with, it's, I mean, a startup is like a family. You're, you're with these people day in and day out and we want to be extra, extra sure that the people we bring on board are really top-notch and uh, 
there's no there's no story of how we'd be willing to move fast on that one thing for sure. These are good perspectives. Yeah, and, and on the hiring thing, work out what people's goals are, mm. right? Because it's very easy for people to say what their goals are when they're aligned with you when you're hiring, right? It's like, yeah, I really care about X, Y, Z. And in my case, I just wanted to accelerate science, which I thought everybody I hired with wanted to share that goal, but it's probably not that many people. Um, but try and see, like, in their daily lives, like, what their goals are, like, what does their reward function? And sometimes people can even be deceiving themselves what their own reward function is. So if you can figure that out, then it's probably the, in my mind, I'm like, that is the key to hiring like figure out what people's goals are mm. so I could go on for hours with these women in fact I may later um, but I do want to leave time for questions that you may have I don't know the makeup of our audience here how many are just um, kind of exploring career options and thinking okay I'm in high-tech uh, education and I, where do I go next and this is definitely a path to a career. Um, I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up because I think this might actually end up being a question that somebody might ask, but it's the subject enough to talk about money. Um, and it's interesting from your perspective that you're like, your business is raising money to fund companies and it's funder the same thing, right? So, and then we've got companies that are building on being funded and it's in that space. So there's an interesting symmetry here. Um, but let's just talk briefly about money. How do you get it? Um, are there any special challenges that you've encountered? And we've, we've heard a bit from you, Ryan, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. But yeah, go ahead. Let's talk. So, <laughs> um, money, I, I think uh, Ryan mentioned the, the stats in terms of women raising money. So I think the conversation is very different for women than it is for the, the general industry. Um, I mentioned earlier that I run a company called Black Women Talk Tech and we, we focus on black women founders and it's even worse <laughs> for, for black women when you sort of add that intersectionality in. Um, I think they're making, usually raising $36,000 on average for their companies, whereas the, the average tech company raises 1.4 million. So I think the paths and the access that we have in terms of raising money is different. Um, and I will say that you definitely, as a founder, need to be around people who are like you so you understand that your experience is, is shared. Because I think in the very beginning, I didn't have that perspective. And so everyone who I was talking to was like, yeah, I'm killing it. I've just raised $10 million off of my idea, off a napkin. And that was not my experience. And so once I found people who were like me and were giving, telling me the same types of stories, it really inspired me and motivated me to keep going to knowing that I wasn't necessarily doing something wrong. It was just that uh, my, my path would be a little bit different. So I don't know if that answers that question. It does for me. Oh, I have so many thoughts about fundraising. Uh, and I, I know you're not supposed to talk about money, but I think it's good to talk about it. <laughs> um, I have a couple thoughts. Uh, so one, to the point earlier, you know, so we, we've had very good fundraising success. We've raised $23 million from Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the best funds in Silicon Valley. And so when you hear that, it just like you forget that the amount of no's that we had to hear in order to get there is like in the thousands. Fundraising is a very, very hard job because you're, it's more than anything, it's just the thing where you're going to hear a lot of no's. Hmm. And you just keep getting punched down and you have to pop back up um, and optimistically tell your story again. So it's very, very hard, um, but, um, but important. And uh, I like your machine learning uh, analogy, so I'll use that for, for fundraising as well. So I think a VC, uh, you know, some, any funder, uh, what they want is they want to be able to look into the future and say, this company will make me a good return. And uh, they can't, obviously, look into the future. And so what they're doing is they're looking for some indications that can serve as proxies for what might be a good future investment. I think one of the things that is hard um, as a female, uh, as a female founder or as a person of color who's trying to raise money is that, you know, if you look like Mark Zuckerberg uh, and you have a story like Mark Zuckerberg, just you know, the the gears are turning in these VCs' minds, and they go, "This person reminds me of Mark Zuckerberg," and that gives them a good feeling. It's part of their machine learning algorithm where they're trying to make prediction. Um, and and when you're this. when you're just a, when you're uh, when you're less represented in this uh, in this space, it's harder it's harder for them to make that connection. Which is why I agree you need to surround yourself with people who um, who share a similar story to you, so that you can remind yourself that uh, you know other success stories like you exist. Um, okay, well, if you can't um, be a white man trying to fundraise, 
then I think some of the other uh, levers that VCs are, you know, in their machine learning algorithm, I think the number one most important one is traction. If your product has traction, uh, then, you know, that's, that's a good early indicator. Um, I think uh, a lot of companies try to get that VC money really quickly, but I think the best thing to do is just try to get that traction first. Then the VCs will be knocking on your door yeah. <laughs> trying to give you money rather than you having to, you know, really plead with them. And then you can say no to them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that happens, um, and that's a good feeling, too. Um, so traction is a really good one. I think the second most important one is having a really good team. So you're not, as a founder, you're not um, raising money by yourself. Uh, you might be the only one in the room, but you're you're selling a company and you're selling a team. Uh, and the third is confidence. Um, and if you come in with confidence, uh, then you know again that's like one of the gears that's turning. You remind them of other people who have had confidence and been successful as well. Yeah, and just from my experience uh, with investment, I kind of have two main takeaways. So the first one is that I didn't come from a business background and I had never done this before. And so when I went to raise investment. I never went after the big figure because I saw all along that whatever investment I took was just debt to my company. And so there is this you know, really trendy thing that you should go after the $10 million, the $15 million, that's so gonna give you a big valuation. I never saw it that way. I thought that's 10 more million dollars I'm gonna have to make up before I make a dollar, or 15 million that I have to make up before I make a dollar. And so go into it and know this is the number that I need to get from an investor in order to get to profitable. Because once you guys are profitable, then you have power over your company. And so really kind of switch that mindset that you don't need to raise a big number, just try to get to profitable. The other thing is we are living in this time when women are able to go out and raise money. It's a staggering low percentage that are able to get it from VCs. But if you tell yourself that story too much, you're going to start to believe it. And so I was fundraising and traveling all over when I was eight months pregnant. And I heard from male investors that they wouldn't be comfortable investing in my company after Q3. And my son was born at the end of October, which is Q3. So you hear those things a lot. But if you start to believe them, you're not going to raise money. And so what you need to know is you need to know the numbers of your business. People invest in people first. And then they invest in who they think is going to make money. And so if you know your numbers inside now, if you can say, you know, it's obvious that you're a woman who's pregnant coming to fundraise. That's something you never even have to address. If you can say that my company here is going to make you this kind of return, this is what we're making now, this is our traction, they're going to invest because they want to make money in the long run. So don't tell too big of a story. Just go in, tell them you're going to make them rich, you're going to get money. Kind of put the woman thing aside. That's very obvious. You don't have to address it. That was so great. Wasn't it? <laughs> I love you guys. And I've only just met you. Um, and I guess an additional point, having been on the investment side for the last few years, is um, be aware that sometimes the no's aren't even to do with you. Uh, like, uh, let's just qualify what an investor is. Most, unless it's an angel investor, it's someone working for a fund like I did, you're investing other people's money predominantly. And it's like, I think of these things like Ponzi schemes, right? Just like Ponzi all the way down. And you have, uh, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a founder and you have like the VC that you're pitching, and the VC has their own investors, which are called limited partners. Right. And limited partners, like, they can be a pool of other funds too, or something like people's pensions. And um, you know, the VC might say no, and it might not be to do even with your company. I had to turn down companies that I wanted to invest in just because um, the contract, the legal contract that I had written with the investors of my investment fund didn't actually align me to be able to take on that business model or take on that uh, company in my investment thesis. And I think that I, when I read startups like tweeting or like complaining about not fundraising, a lot of them kind of say like, well, you know, why did this person say no? And uh, I always can understand kind of like looking at the venture fund why they said no. And they're not going to give you in all this detail about their like background legal stuff. Um, but you know, just remember that they are middlemen and women and they have their own li liabilities and uh, sometimes there's nothing to do with you. And uh, I think that that's a portrayal of venture capital that I really think that narrative should be presented more. Um, that it's, uh, that, they're, that yeah, they're just like, they're, they're, they're middlemen themselves. They're entrepreneurs themselves, you know. Right. So. Yeah, and to remember that that's your most important meeting of the day and you're one of probably 20 for them that day. So don't take yourself too seriously. Like you prepared this entire time to go to that meeting, they are hearing 20 other pitches that exact same day. They're so doing speed dating. To troll them, honestly, that's like the best advice I could say anything. It's just like, I don't know, I just had so much fun trolling investors, like that's how I raise all my money. Define that. Um, I don't know. I guess they're so expected. They're so used to everyone taking them so seriously. Right. And I would just walk in and I don't know. I just have an attitude. It's not even that I'm trying to have an attitude. I was just like, I don't know. I, 
I just think if you don't take it seriously, then you're demonstrating that you're not going to take the failure seriously too. And it shows that you have a good risk appetite. Um, so for instance, there's one venture fund, which I won't name, but they have an office in Sand Hill Road. They have like a stream around it. And I thought it'd be really funny, me and my business partners, we put like rubber ducks before our meeting. So it's just like ducks everywhere. And uh, I mean, we actually raise money from them. But I don't know, people are bored. This is the thing. People are so bored, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, in their Patagonia jackets. Be memorable. Uh, yeah, be entertaining. Because then it's also fun for you because when you, they say no to you you're like well it doesn't matter because I put ducks in your pond so right. I'll never forget that one <laughs> have fun out there okay uh, does anyone have any questions because you know I could I could ask more but what do you want to know from these women there's one there do we have a microphone um, I've heard the statistic around the 2% of uh, venture funding going to women. Do you guys have any sense of how many of the asks come from women? Is it also that 2% of the asks come from women? Or is it disproportionate? Because part of what I sense, maybe just to some of the comments earlier, is that maybe we have this unhealthy fear of we're only going to go to venture funds when we're really ready and when we have our business completely ironed out. And so, I, you know, part of that whole imposter syndrome and wanting to really validate our own businesses that are we asking for money way too late or not enough and trying to build it ourselves. What a fantastic question. I don't know the stats overall. Um, I, I think there's this idea that there's a pipeline problem with uh, companies coming into investment. I don't think that's true, quite frankly. Um, especially with Black Women Talk Tech, we um, track um, over 500 uh, founders and their companies. And I know for a fact that they're all fundraising. Most of them have been doing it for years. Um, and they are hitting you know, every angel investor seed round uh, you know, VC that you can think of. So I don't think that that's the issue. I do think one of the problems is that um, typically in this industry, uh, a lot of the money has moved to later rounds. So there's not as much money in the angel world and in the seed world. And so they're looking for your traction, like we mentioned before, to be a lot higher, a lot further. They're looking for um, the money that you're making on a monthly basis to be a lot higher. So that is a trend that's happening that, uh, you know, now the Ubers are getting the bulk of the money versus the, the earlier companies. And I think if you're not ready for that or you're just starting up, um, that could be that could be an issue. But I don't I don't know any of the the stats overall. Um, I will say that as a female managing partner of a venture fund uh, for three years, I didn't have a single female founder um, apply for investment from me. I didn't have a single female to apply to work with me. I really wanted some. Um, and uh, I do think that, I mean, the, the stats are, well, actually, I think most stats are bullshit. But in, in this case, you know, there is obviously a problem with female founders, but I just don't think many of them are taking risks um, or doing things. And it's, it's, it's kind of this confidence thing, right? It's like, you know, uh, is my product ready? Should I try and raise money for it? Or should I even become a founder in the first place? Um, do I have the appetite for that? But uh, but it has been interesting to see the opposite side, that uh, I didn't have a single... Maybe it's, Wait, maybe just women just hate me. I didn't think... Maybe it was just me. Okay, maybe I shouldn't answer this question. Well, it's interesting what you said. Um, you know, you could think I don't have the aptitude, but sometimes it is the appetite for risk. Yeah, and it's, and it's not like, I mean, people talk about working in venture capital and founder stuff like it's like somewhat glamorous and to be aspired for, but most of my female friends did not, were not envious of my job. I slept in the closet of our venture fund for a year and a half. That was my bed. I bought the domain homeless.vc because I thought it was quite funny that I was putting all my money into the company so I'd sleep in the closet like Harry Potter. But, um, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's not an enviable life. I mean, we, we're all here sitting like it's amazing. Uh, and it is really fun. But uh, at the same time, it's horrible. And, uh, and none of my female friends wanted my job. So, like, maybe the women are just making the right choices and uh, having more fun with their lives. Because everyone was like, you want to go to Burning Man? And I was like, no, I've got to work again. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's not, we, we've very much glamorized this uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, thing to such an extent um, but, uh, you know, if you if it just, I don't know, this adds some humidity there, I think. It's, it actually sucks a lot of the time. Perspective. Perspective. Right. Anyone else? I'm just curious as to where you all found the inspiration for uh, the companies that you started and uh, how you implemented that into, like, doing things versus just your imaginative stage. Great question. So I graduated from the University of Washington in 2010, and I did the very logical thing with my degree, and I went off and I modeled all over the world for the next five years. And that was really my in 
introduction into the fashion world. And so it'd be on you know, these photo shoot sets with big companies that I realized there's a huge problem with what people were seeing in the images online. Think Nordstrom, Amazon, Macy's, Neiman's. If you're going for a pair of jeans, let me tell you that that jean does not look like that on the model in real life. We had things clipped and pinned and photoshopped, and so I would be on set shooting these items. I'd see how they look at the end result, and I would think there's a huge problem here with what people see and what they get to their door. We need to provide more transparency and more seamless shopping experience. So that was my um, inspiration to create Fit Code. Word. Shine on jeans. For my first company, Keep Up, which um, automated social media analysis, um, that came because I was working in a social media agency and we were looking at big data and trying to find insights for companies. And so I really wanted to find a way to automate that and make it cheaper because we had a team of 10 people and it cost thousands of dollars to do it. So I figured there was an easier way to, to approach that. Um, for Black Women Talk Tech, I literally fell into that. That was not meant to be a company at all. It was literally just friends that I knew in the industry meeting, um, and then that kind of blew up into a conference. Um, and then for Funder, that uh, really just came from my experience fundraising and, and thinking about how even though VCs really love to disrupt other industries, they haven't really been disrupted themselves in any kind of meaningful way. And so um, sort of taking this idea of, of automating it and making it um, a lot faster to make introductions, to get access to capital, and, and open up that opportunity for people who are not necessarily in Silicon Valley or don't have access to the right people to, um, to build that out. Um, I think that a lot of times people have this thought, which is, I want to be an entrepreneur, and I think that's putting the cart a little bit before the horse. I think yeah. what these stories show is that First, you say there's a problem in the world, and then you try to figure out ways to solve that problem. And oftentimes, the way to solve that problem is to go work at a company that is already working on solving that problem. And sometimes, no one is solving that problem. So for us at Astronis, there's this great s statistic that completely shocked me, which is that the number of people who don't have internet in the world is actually going up over time because the parts of the world that are underserved are continuing to be underserved, and in the meanwhile, those places' populations are growing. And so this is just a problem that isn't being solved. And if that's a problem that I care about, then, um, then I don't have the option of going to work at another company, right? It's something that you have to start. And so huh. um, I think that, uh, I don't know, like a Silicon Valley trope, right? It's like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to run my own business. But I think, uh, I, I think that the right way to approach it is, what is the problem that you're passionate about solving? Go find that problem. And then if no one is solving that, you know, if no one is solving that problem, that's when you say, okay, well, I'll make this horrible sacrifice of having to sleep on the floor and all that stuff, which is what it's like um, oftentimes uh, because that's, that's the only way to, to get there. Because mm. uh, it's relevant for anyone who's doing computer science. Um, I think that AI has the power to change everything. Um, and I studied philosophy and neuroscience and then some computer science. And uh, when I first moved to the Bay Area, I was actually really interested in lo uh, longevity research, like uh, biotech. And I was looking at all the problems across all sciences, right? Like, why is R&D slow? Why does it cost a billion dollars to bring a drug to market? Why does it take 10 years? And I kept thinking, well, if you could accelerate the R&D pipeline, if you could make tools that make R&D cheaper, faster, better, then you have a way to accelerate all of science. And why is that important? Because actually, the extent of human flourishing depends on the current limit of science. Like, we... We die to the limit of where science can say this. You know, self-driving people die in car accidents because we don't have self-driving cars. Like, our, our flourishing is is limited by science. Like, I just think science is the coolest thing. And um, and when I hit on uh, uh, looking at all these uh, kind of like biotech startups, I was like, well, if you just create these tools to do reproducibility or you know um, anything like even if it's like cloud labs, uh, you could just accelerate science. And uh, you know, I'm thinking about getting accelerate science tattooed on my hands next week. But uh, the reason why I created an AI venture fund was I thought there are two tools, right? You have finance, which is one tool, which is the ability to like deliver money to projects, which is, you know, money is a tool. Like we, we, we put this kind of like sentiment on it sometimes, but it really is just as a tool. It can do good and it can do bad. And you have machine learning, which is this tool, which is just like you take a really complex problem and you're able to solve it in a way that like, you know, humans can't because of the availability of how it processes data. And I was thinking, well, if you could just apply that to science, like you could just have 1% increases on R&D across the world and, and make that better. And 
I started my venture fund and it wasn't, it wasn't able to solve the problem I wanted to solve, but I was still stuck on that problem. And it took me a year and a half of living in Joshua Tree for the last year and a half and reflecting on all the things I did wrong. But now I'm actually gonna go and work in hardware. And the reason why I'm gonna go work in hardware is that I saw that hardware is a first principle kind of like limit for machine learning. So mm -hmm. if you can make hardware better, um, then you actually change the playing fields for everyone. So I keep kind of like reverse engineering to try and solve that problem. But I think if you really find a problem that you care about, your career will just continuously change. Um, but you'll, you'll, you'll like at the end of the day, I'm at, when I'm lying in bed at night, I'm like, did I do anything today that will help contribute towards the acceleration of science? And if I haven't, then I'm like, oh, I should probably like drink a whiskey or something. But, but yeah, so, so do things that you care about. I, yeah, I got a big grin on my face the whole time. Just all of your stories are so fantastic.